Thank you. Can everybody hear me from, from here? I'll stand over here somewhere. But, um, so my first warning is his most lethal part of him is his tail. He whacks it around <laughs> like a baseball bat. So there we go. Um, do we want to turn the lights down a little bit? Or is that? So my, my program is called Harnessing History on the Trail of uh, New Hampshire State Dog. And when we talk about the Chinook Trail, we're actually talking about a, a physical landmark, which is about seven miles long. Then we're also talking about the historic physical trails that the Chinooks went on. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And, and then it's also sort of space and time. So it's over time and through space. So we're going to go on quite an adventure. But first, we have to have a word from our sponsors. <laughs> the New Hampshire Humanities Council, you already heard about. Great introduction there. Um, it also is a private nonprofit, receives no regular funding from the state or any other government agency, so it relies on donations. And uh, you can get the information there or from the website. This is actually the 40th year. And this year, they're giving something like over 500 presentations throughout the year. So, Every night, there's something in one or two or three or four different towns. Uh, the other place is the Henny History Room, where I am the uh, curator and genealogist. And um, unlike a lot of town library history rooms, we cover not only the town of Conway that I just sort of marked there, but also all of uh, Carroll County, New Hampshire, as well as the White Mountains, which in New Hampshire is in two separate sections, goes over into Maine. And then um, the person who founded us, the Henny family, um, kind of endowed the uh, history room. They realized that we had more to do with Freiburg and Porter, uh, Maine, than we did with Nashua. <laughs> or Coas County, Berlin, and those places. So we actually cover a specified part of western Oxford County, Maine, which takes us all the way to the Canadian border. So that's where I get to cover. So part of my job there is to do historical and geological research. And I've done it on a number of different subjects, different topics. The Cleveland family, of course, we have some kind of election going on or something, but uh, the Democratic uh, Grover Cleveland, uh, who ran two not consecutive terms, but two terms. He was elected, then he lost, and he was elected again as president. Um, sports stars, Babe Ruth and his family, Summer and Conway. Uh, community leaders, European royalty. There was a lady named um, Lady Blanche, and she was in line to become Queen of England. Now she was like 33rd or something. But she married a commoner, and she got kicked out of the line of succession, and she settled in, Con in the Conway area but by far the most sophisticated, distinguished client that I've ever worked with, and also the best kisser is right over there. <laughs> so he's kind of wandering around, which is good, because I don't want him to hear part of what I'm going to say in a moment or two. So we're going to follow his tale, literally. He was born August 2nd, 2005, so he's uh, just turned uh, 10 years old. His full name is Mountain Laurel Tamworth Tugger. Mountain Laurel comes from the... Um, kennel that he is out of in Connecticut. And as a baby, he was adopted into a loving family, of course, Red Sox fans. But like so many other adopted children, he wondered about his ancestry, and he wanted to know about his birth parents and his family name. So we used to go by a place that was called the Chinook Cafe up in Conway, and he would say to us, let's stop and have some food. And he would say, now, who's this Chinook guy? Who's this? You know, I kind of look like that, a mini version of that. And he asked us to take him to the Chinook kennels, and we took him up there. But we had to do some research to do this, and we found out that the Chinook kennels, they never raise Chinooks at the Chinook kennels. So it's one of those things. There's a book called Lies My Teacher Told Me, and it's about all these problems that these historic <laughs> markers have. And so they don't really point out the fact that they didn't raise Chinooks there. 
So we'll tell you about that. So we looked at his pedigree. This is his parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. And then we did uh, archival research on the, the founder of the breed, who, of course, is the great Chinook. And this is the great, uh, actually, it's Chinook's parents. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about them. So it's Kim and Ningo. And they had Chinook January 17, 1917. And then he was bred out to, uh, in this line to a Belgian shepherd and to a German shepherd, and then back around. And this one, we'll see Huchino, and this was to Kyrie, who continued the breed. You'll see here that on the right it says, Ningo, full-blood Eastern Eskimo dog, granddaughter of Peary's lead dog team to the North Pole. Now, Kim, on the other hand, was a mutt. So we had to do all this archival research, but we realized that wasn't going to get us where we wanted to be. So we had to do DNA studies. At that time, there were about 800 registered Chinooks in our club. And uh, we had DNA testing done on about 75% uh, of them. And so we were able to find out what breeds are mixed in there through uh, probably Kim and other times that they were outbred. So it's kind of interesting. So as we go through this little research project, why is the Chinook New Hampshire state dog? You made a great point in saying that it is a Chinook, it is a state dog, but why? You already answered that one. What role did the school kids have in making it? And why is that road, there's a road in Tamworth that's called the Chinook Trail, why is it called that? And then why is there a historic marker at a place where it shouldn't be? <laughs> All right, now, if you can, kind of direct his attention somewhere else. I don't want to hear this part. In doing genealogical research, you probably realize that sometimes there's skeletons in the family closet. And we don't want to let him know, but there's a history of bipolar behavior in his family. <laughs> now, I kind of already gave you a hint of that. His, one of his ancestors went to the North Pole, was the lead team. And one of his ancestors, the Great Chinook, was the lead dog to the South Pole. So when we talk about the Chinook Trail, we're actually talking about the whole Earth. We're talking about places like Vietnam, California. We're talking about Alaska, Brazil. These Chinook dogs are all over the place, and there's history. But it all started actually with, with the birth of uh, Arthur Walden, 1871. And I put in there that Jack London was born January 12, 1876. So he was just a few years uh, younger. And there's some pa interesting parallels there. In 1896, when he was 24 years old, Arthur Walden caught the gold fever and went up to Alaska and went to the gold fields. And Jack London left the next year. Now, he only stayed up there a year, whereas Walden stayed up there for six years. So he had a lot more adventures. So if you're comparing these two guys, they had very interesting comparable writing styles. They both were very dramatic, very evocative. Um, they both drank a lot. <laughs> so this is one of the books that Walden wrote. And um, it's called Dog Puncher on the Yukon. And that was one of the phrases called dog puncher. So sometimes people call them mushers. Sometimes people call them teamsters, so on and so forth. Um, but dog puncher was the teamster job that he did. And the, the Chinook breed has always been large part freight dogs. So, you think of the Iditarod, you, if you've been to some of the races, I'll show you some pictures later, of these smaller dogs that now win all these races. Um, they were actually more working dogs. And uh, so what he would do, show you here on a map, you would go up to Alaska, through the, up through the Yukon River on a steamboat like you just saw. But the idea was you wanted to be in the gold fields as soon as you could take a pick and go through into the ground. So you went at the winter and waiting for the spring. Chinook, by the way, means warm west wind, which is the forebringer of spring weather. So you'd go to Circle City, but you needed to get over to the Klondike, Dawson City. And you could walk, or you could hire a dog team. And that's what a lot of people did, 200 miles. So um, when he was done with that adventure and came back, wrote some books, he went to Wanalancet. He married Catherine Sleeper, and together they operated this inn, the uh, Wanalancet farm. The building is still there today, so still by descendants of the family. Brought that to New Hampshire? Yes, yes. Well, I'll show you some maps where it is and stuff. Um, 
So Call of the Wild was published in 1903. White Fang was published in 1906. And you can see there was a taste in popular culture for dog sledding and dog teams and adventures uh, about that. So what Walden did is he wanted to run an inn. And kind of like today, if you go to the ski areas, they've, in the past few years, you'll notice they've all added zip lines. When we first came here about 20 years ago, there wasn't a single zip line in the state of New Hampshire. And now everybody's got one. And so this was something he wanted to drive tourism. He could do it in the winter. You'll see later he could do it in the summer. And so he wanted to get a team of dogs. But they couldn't be difficult dogs. They couldn't be like, uh, they had to be friendly to people, but also be able to pull people around and give a good ride. So his first team were these Bernese Mountain Dogs, Rudyard, Kip, and Ling. I don't know where he got the names from. <laughs> And they were great, but he was kind of like a showman and a little bit like P.T. Barnum. And he realized that if he could create his own distinctive looking team, then he could get more media attention, which is exactly what happened. So here's Kim on the left and Ningo on the right. Now, one of the things I will tell you is when I have information from a book, um, from a newspaper, from a source, specific source, or even if it's a story, I can tell you who told me the story when. And I haven't really been able to get definitive information about Walden and his breeding. But I can kind of imagine um, that he, he perhaps he tried a number of times. I don't know. But somehow he saw in the breeding of these two dogs the, the possibility of creating this breed. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, you see, we have all adults in the room, I think. I can tell you this story. Oh, OK, we'll plug your ears. So, if you've ever bred dogs, they, they, sometimes they don't take to each other. So you, his, his idea was he had two kennels, and he was going to bring them closer, and he was going to feed them and get them on the same cycle, everything like that. And he was telling Lillian Bowles, who's one of the longest running postmistresses in the state of New Hampshire, this when she came to Whittier Station to pick up uh, the mail, and these dogs were crated. And <laughs> She said, I don't think you're going to have that problem. And they are, so they bred right there at the West Osby train station. <laughs> so I, I guess they, they liked each other. And then uh, they created these three little guys. Now, they were first named um, Ricky, Ticky, and Tavi. And again, I don't know where he's getting these names from. <laughs> but uh, Ricky was later renamed Chinook. And uh, then, um, let's see, uh, Ricky, Ticky. Tiki was renamed Huchino, and we talked about him just a second ago. But what you see here, go back, if you, in your mind, go back to the previous pictures of the two dogs that look very dissimilar. You see how all three of these have the very distinctive markings? They're all around the same size, because they're you know, triplets. Um, and then here they are at a year later, and they do look a little bit like Dad, who's in the front, and then Ricky, Tiki, and Tavi. And when you're looking for a dog team that you're going to be having paying guests, go around with, you want a very calm, you know, quiet dog. And so here's Tiki showing that he's not, that he's a little too rambunctious. He's actually pulled the harness, but Chinook is just there like, that's okay, I'm cool, no problem. You told me to go straight, I'll go straight. And, uh, and so that's really what you want. And so he bred that into, or that was bred into uh, this team of dogs. Now, to put it in context, one of the things hum humanities people do, historians, is uh, around the same time, not only did we have Jack London, but we had Rin Tin Tin, who starred in 27 Hollywood films. It was actually given the most votes for best uh, actor. But some person looked up in the rule book and said, oh, no, you have to be a human. But then they changed that rule, apparently, because I think Snow White got it at one time, didn't she? <laughs> anyway, so 1922. And this was all to promote this breed and kind of get dog sledding going. He organized the first uh, official sled dog races, with, um, which was an international race from Berlin, New Hampshire, up to Canada and back, and 123 miles. And of course, he won with Chinook. But now you can see all of the descendants of Chinook. In just those few years, they all look like carbon copies of Chinook. So this dominant gene pool has started to replicate itself. And they call the gray Chinook is a, a force of nature called a sport. And able to have those dominant genes which carry through so many, many generations. 
The other thing that he did is he opened his uh, kennels to the public. And I've given this talk a number of times, and the gentleman came up a few years ago, and he showed me this picture, and he said that his mom had visited the great Chinook, and it was dated August 20th, 1922. And he said, oh, it was so cool. She talks about it. Stuff. And then he said, do you want to meet her? She was in the audience. And she was 89 years old. And uh, Laura, uh, let's see, Laura Smith Whitworth. And she vividly remembered. I mean, she was like a little girl when she was talking to me. She says, oh, yeah, he hugged me, and I hugged him, and all this. And uh, so that's, that, of course, is why this thing works. <laughs> And now in 1922 also is the Tamworth's winter, first winter carnival. And you can see, look, they all look like Chinook. 1924, they started the uh, New England Sled Dog Club, the oldest um, operating club of its kind in the United States. And they put on the race in Shakoroa, which is the most, pic I think, the most picturesque race. And here's Atticus preparing for the uh, Shakoroa race. Yeah. I don't think he pulls a lot, but he certainly has the heart. His heart's in it. <laughs> so, yeah, so he's met Atticus and vice versa. Another promotional activity that he did is March 1926. He took uh, Chinook, led the team up to Mount Washington, the first dog sled team to ever make it to the top of Mount Washington. Eight hours, yeah, eight miles in eight hours. And you can see here the Summit House is totally frozen, cased in ice. So in 1927, he heard that there was this adventure going on, that expedition was going to go down the South Pole. And he was in his 50s, and he still applied. And he convinced Admiral Byrd that he was the man for the job. And then he had some assistants that came from Harvard, uh, Fred Crockett, Ed Goodall, Norman Vaughn. And they were known later as the Three Musketeers, because they hung out together. And so there were a lot of these promotional shots. Uh, here's Admiral Byrd sitting on one of the sledges um, with the three musketeers and Walden. You can very distinctive hat that he used to wear. Here they are making gloves for the expedition. This picture was example in the Boston Globe. So uh, they also experimented with different tents, trying to find the lightest tent that was the strongest because a lot of strong winds down there and um, that could hold the biggest amount of space. So all these things were going on in Wanna Lancet, at the Wanna Lancet farm. 1928, uh, cover of the newspaper, talks about Chinook taking 18 sons into the frozen south. And by then, Chinook was, was a pretty famous dog. And uh, there were 90 other dogs that they were in charge of. And as I say, Walden was 56 at the time. Now. Throughout the story, I'll tell you some of the wonderful stories that Arthur Walden would tell around the fireplace uh, when he came back and um, he'd play music and, you know, to entertain his guests. Admiral Byrd also wrote a number of books and he kept a journal. And the difference between the writing style of Arthur Walden and Admiral Byrd is like night and day. You really need both of these guys because if Byrd was able to describe the size and the cubic uh, space of the ship, the cubic feet, the amount of dry food, the amount of wet food, the weight, the volume, and how many screws you're going to need, and how many extra screws you're going to need, how many gallons of gasoline, how many, you know, this type of gasoline, that type of gasoline. Um, but boy, it would be boring if you went down with, just with him. <laughs> you know, it was very dry. On the other hand, if you just went with Walden, you might have a great time, but you'd probably starve to death because you might have forgotten the food or something like that. <laughs> so together, they worked pretty well. They didn't always get along, but it's, it's kind of, that's a whole, whole neat story in itself. So they left New England. They went through the Panama Canal. They went across the Pacific Ocean to New Zealand, where they refueled and they uh, did their final restocking. And what's great about the Earth, especially if you're going to go to the South Pole, that the South Pole is kind of like a big circle, except there's a big dent in it. So the idea was you sail that, your ships all the way into that dent, and you're very close to the South Pole, right there. So you see the big dent, and it's conveniently located near New Zealand, so you can load up and everything. So you just sail it in there, and you're home free. No big deal, right? <laughs> except if you look really closely at this map, there's a little dotted line right here. Can everybody see that? The Ross Ice Shelf. So if you could just sail to the edge of land, 
you're only 300 miles, which would be two days by dog sled. But because the Ross ice shelf is sticking in your way, it's 800 miles, adds 500 more miles. So you're really talking about some issues here. So here's a picture of the Ross ice shelf. And you see, radiating out from a certain point, this is the base called Little America. And now remember, uh, the Chinooks are freight dogs. So their job is to take gasoline and food and other provisions, scientific instruments and stuff, and take them and put them in different places so that the scientists on this expedition can go around and um, not starve or freeze to death. So they worked out of the base of Little America. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that this, of course, was not the first time that people had gone to the South Pole. But it's kind of like, uh, well, I was, I was hearing on the radio today about the founder, I think it was Amazon or something, is now into spaceships. And he wants to be like, you know, privatized space flight. So this was the age of technology. So Bird wanted to be the first human being ever to fly in an airplane over the South Pole. And not only did he want to fly over the South Pole, he wanted to do like, he wanted to tweet. Well, what they called then was radio. So he wanted to fly over the South Pole and radio to everybody in the world. I am Admiral Byrd. I'm now flying over the South Pole. <laughs> and, and that's what he wanted to do. So it was all about technology. And some people said that, why are you bringing sled dogs? Why don't you just bring modern equipment? So there's Little America. There's the South Pole. Well, when they were going from New Zealand towards the South Pole, they started driving by these things, the iceberg. And where do you think the icebergs come from? The Ross Ice Shelf. So this is the Ross Ice Shelf. Now, I looked very closely at this, and I don't see any beaches. I don't see any docks. <laughs> I don't see any like cabanas with the little tiki uh, drinks, you know? So this is ice, right? This is 500 miles of ice. So this is not terra firma. This is not ground. This is ice that might go down 100, 200. Because remember, most of the ice is underwater. You might have 500 feet of ice there. And it's. The icebergs are coming from the ice shelf. Well, that's because the thing cracks and bumps and changes and breaks off, and there floats away a giant iceberg. So you've got to land your boat there and unload everything. Look at that. The ice is halfway up the mast. So you've got to take everything from the bottom of the hold, every can of beans, and put it halfway up the mast and then get it on the ice shelf while the ice shelf is calving off icebergs. Here you are on the ice shelf looking at one of the ships. Now, this is a great photograph it's, if you study it. I love this. Um, it's called Unloaded the Floyd Bennett. And Admiral Byrd writes, several hours after this photograph was taken, the barrier collapsed and menaced the vessel. You know, she puts the vessel first. Menaced the vessel as well as the lives of a number of men. Now, if Walden had written that sentence, that caption of this photograph, he would have talking about death and destruction, people dying, and you know, danger, danger. Uh, the other thing, so this is unloading one of the three airplanes. This is a boom. And so it's fine to be at that angle. So it's like a little arm that you move around. You pick up your airplane, you put it over here. This, however, is the main mast. That's supposed to be straight up and down. So you are in the middle of nowhere, at the edge of the Ross Ice Shelf. There's no auto mechanics down there. This thing, the boat, is leaning over. And as I said, happened, luckily, several hours later. But what if the ice shelf had cracked open right then? Then it would be great if you just loaded there and everything was nice and flat. Well, no. It was a little up and down, and a little bit left and right. Now, the thing is, 
The dogs, they're used to this. There was a lot of experience, 1,000 years of experience with sled dogs in the Arctic. And these guys had tons and tons of experience. And the dogs have these senses. I remember the first time we went out on Shakorawa Lake with Tug. And he goes straight as an arrow. And all of a sudden, he veers off to the right and goes around, comes back. And we're like, whoa, what happened? So we stopped him. We used our little snow break, because he was still practice or training. And uh, we looked around, and there was an ice fisherman's hole. Now, how did he know that? You know, has he got some kind of sonar or radar? Or, you know, who knows? But he knew not to go, that there was a thin spot of. So these dogs are smart. Not only that, if the lead dog does go down a crevasse, the other dogs are smart enough to stop and back up. And vice versa, if the, if the uh, driver slides over and goes down, they'll pull him out. And they've been doing that for thousands of years. So here we are at Little America. And this is the map that Bird drew. And he planned it all out. And on here, there's all kinds of things. Um, he has the uh, meteorological station, the um, Norwegian house. I don't know why they put the Norwegians all together way far from everybody else. They had the kite house because they were doing studies of different types. Um, they had the radio station. But the dog tunnel, number 29, they put there way far away from everything else. Now what they did is, I was talking about those cans of beans. Everything was marked and labeled and inventoried. So if three months into your stay down there, you wanted can, a can of beans, you would go down these aisles. So they, they unloaded everything was loaded in a very specific way. So you'd be able to go down there and you'd be able to find what you're looking for. So you can also see here the radio towers. There's three radio towers right there. When work tied together, they give a stronger signal. So they did this, and then they covered it over with uh, wood and canvas and stuff like that. And they just waited. Because remember, they're at the South Pole. And you've got snow. And after a few days, this is what happened. The snow went halfway up the radio towers. And it says here that the camp is entirely snowed under, and only the radio towers, the flag, and smokestacks are able to be seen. So they didn't dig down. They didn't dig tunnels. They just piled everything up and waited. And here's the dog tunnels. Can you imagine what that sounded like? Can you imagine what it smelled like? So that's why they put the dog people off to their own. And they loved it. They were perfectly happy. But so imagine this was your commissary aisle. And you'd have a little map or a little booklet. And you'd go down and you'd say, well, I go 37 feet, turn right, two and a half feet up, take your ice axe, chop away, and there's your can of baked beans. <laughs> Admiral Bird brought a pet, <laughs> Igloo. Igloo has his own book about him. I don't think he was uh, a big puller. I don't think he did a lot of weight. So this is a wonderful photograph. That's in, a lot of these photographs are in different institutions. Uh, this one's at the University of Ohio, which why in the world is the University of Ohio <laughs> have this incredible polar archives? I don't know. But it's got these great pictures. And here's a couple of the airplanes. And here's these dogs. And so I can just imagine some of the PR people who are trying to promote this to people like, oh, I should have shown you on the map. When they went down there, um, one of the guys was the National Geographic guy. And when he did his explorations on the map, he mapped the Rockefeller Mountains, the Edsel Ford Mountains. <laughs> I wonder who funded some of this stuff. And so these guys wanted to support modern technology. They really weren't interested in having a bunch of dogs in the front of the picture. But the thing is, dogs have certain characteristics that stand them well. In winter, tech, in winter times, though they're dead animals. You saw the little cube, little doorway that the dog would stay. This guy can tie, go up into the size of a basketball, sit on the couch. So they're den animals by nature. They curl up. 
So if you've got some wind coming up and some snow, say three, four inches of snow, 50 mile an hour winds, they just tighten up and cover up. And more snow, more wind. And then if you ring the bell and it's time for food, they're just going to pop up, crawl out, and come right over to you. Now, so they have these three airplanes. Airplanes aren't very good at curling up. And so they had these 100 mile an hour winds. And there goes number one. Remember, the whole purpose of this is to fly over the South Pole. One's gone. Number two is gone. They have one plane, the whole purpose is expedition. And they only have one plane left. Not only that, they brought these things, <laughs> snowmobiles. These were uh, Model T Ford snowmobiles. And Ford also made the, um, the planes. And so he was really interested in this expedition. But this type of snowmobile actually has a very interesting connection. Do people know about this? OK. Up in our way, we do. So this, you buy a regular Model T Ford. And then you buy this conversion kit. And you take the front wheel off. And you have an axle kit. And you put the two wheels in the back. You put treads on them. And you put skis in the front. And this was patented in 1917 by getting Virgil White out of Ossipee, New Hampshire. So the snowmobile came from Ospi, New Hampshire. <laughs> if you go to Ospi now, the town signs proclaim that, home of the first snowmobile. There's one in the Ace Hardware uh, on display. So it's really interesting to look at. And this is actually where they were made. If you go up there now, it's right across the street from Hobbs Brewery. And that is uh, where Virgil White lived. And his factory was right across the street. They tore the factory down a few years ago. Um, but you can see here the kit. And that's my kids on a ride. And then we convinced a friend of ours to take us out on <laughs> Lake Shikoroa. Now, in his journal, uh, Bird would write these various sentences. And he liked this, uh, this rivalry that was going on between the snowmobile guys and the dog men, as he called them. It says, there's the greatest rivalry between the crew of the snowmobile and the dogmen. Remember these names, Fury and Blackie, two of those Scandinavian guys. Uh, Fury and Blackie are boasting they will take the snowmobile straight on to the pole if the road isn't cluttered up by those slow moving dog teams. And it says, I like their spirit. That's what he wrote in his journal at that point. I'd like to go back to one of the stories that Walden used to tell around the, the, um, the fireplace. And this goes back to his days in the Yukon. And it's in one of his books um, that I'll show you a little bit later. But um, when he was up there, you, if you've seen The Gold Rush by Charlie Chaplin, there's a scene where they go up the Chiclet Pass, which is about 12,000 feet. And it's a very, very narrow path. And people would just line up, single file, to get through this pass. Well, he ran into a bunch of horse guys up there. And they're like, oh, our horses are strong and fast. And you know, we're going to stomp on your dogs and kill them if they're on our way. Well, Walden just kind of sat back and relaxed, because he knew something. He knew about animals. He knew a lot about animals. And he knew that dogs pant. They don't sweat. So the horses took off at a gallop loaded down with tons of gear, and started going uphill. How many of you ever hiked uphill? <laughs> OK. You start sweating a little bit. OK. Then add a nice light rain, freezing rain. Add 20 or 30 or 40 miles an hour of wind, more elevation. What do you think ended up to the horses? They were dinner. They were dinner for the dogs. They froze to death. And the horses ate them. I mean, the dogs ate them. So, so he had that kind of experience. So he would look at these things and say, OK, that's great. It's fast. But how's it going to do on crevasses? Not so great. <laughs> Somehow, the snowmobiles didn't have the technology to know that the ice was thin. 
<laughs> and they ended up like this. And this is one of my favorite photographs. It's called The End of a Long Haul. The snowmobile party, Strom, another one of those Scandinavian guys, Black and Fury, returned to Little America after 80 miles of man hauling. They had to hook themselves up like dogs and bring their gear. Otherwise, they'd freeze to death. So they had to leave their snowmobile 80 miles and walk back. Strom shouldered, he's in the front, 40-pound knapsack, and Black and Fury, who were going to run over the dogs with their snowmobiles, had to hitch themselves up to a 300-pound sled and bring it back. Could you imagine the reception they got that night by the dog guys? <laughs> the three musketeers? So that's, that's sort of one of the adventures, that, a couple of the adventures that happened. So now Admiral Byrd is changing his tune in his diary and later in his, written, in his publications. He says that the dogs have delighted me beyond words. We can now see that the wisest thing we've done was to insist upon bringing a great many dogs. We were assured that half the number we demanded would serve our purposes, but now with the problems of unloading confronting us, we can use everyone and many more for that matter. So it was really the dogs that helped this thing happen. Had it not been for the dogs, our attempts to conquer the Antarctic by air must have ended in failure. He did uh, fly over the pole, and his plane is in the um, Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in Detroit, outside of Detroit. But there's a poignant sort of sad ending to the dog part of the story. On his 12th birthday, January 17, 1929, Chinook, we know, was lost in Antarctica. Walden was there. He unharnessed him, hooked him up to a pole outside, as was his usual case and the next morning he was gone. Now this is another one of those holes in the story. I can't document exactly what happened because Walton came back and he told one story to the Boy's Life magazine. He told a different story to the National Geographic magazine. He told a different story to the Time magazine. So I've read all different kinds of stories attributed to Walton about what happened. Um, probably the most the sort of romantic one, I guess you would call it, is as the head the lead dog of a team, you're constantly challenged. And that day was the only day, he didn't lose a fight, but he was teamed up by three younger dogs and he didn't win the fight. So the, if you make the connection, you kind of think, well, if he wasn't gonna be the lead dog, he was gonna go off and that was it for him. So when Walden came back, people wanted to name the road from Tamworth Village up to his home. Chinook, I mean, uh, Walden Road. And he said, no, we should honor Chinook and call it the Chinook Trail. And so that's why it's named that. And this is the great Chinook with his harness uh, and the so signs that we use. So this is a little a thing we did for AAA. That's Tug in Tamworth Village. And it shows going up. And so if you go up the Chinook Trail at 5.3 miles is the, <coughs> excuse me, the state sign that says Chinook Kennels. And then if you go up a couple more miles is the farm where Chinook was actually born. Then the one lance at Chapel. But then <coughs> around the corner is this little place called one lance at Hubbard Kennels. And so I'll tell you how that ties into the story. This is looking from Mount Sleeper, named after Kat, Kate Sleeper, down at the Intervale. All of that land has now been preserved as part of the uh, conservation uh, easements. So there's the chapel. Now, how many of you have been up through One Lancet and seen the chapel in this area? So it's a really, really beautiful place. There's uh, Mount Chakarua, as my dad would call it. <laughs> this is the One Lancet Farm Inn. So it's that red building I just showed you. Across the street, Walden operated uh, a farm. So when you went to the One Lancet Inn, you had all your produce and your milk and your meat was all from the farm right there. They also had tennis courts and swim pools and stuff like that. Um, then there was this great little log cabin that he built called the Antlers Tea Room. It had this great big giant antlers out front. Now all of these buildings, everything you see here is still there today. So if you go up there, you can see these places. But in between the tea house and the farm, the inn, was Walden's house. That's no longer here, and we'll talk about that later. So that's where they lived in among this really beautiful 
just fantastic place. There's all kinds of things around there, even today. The sandwich creamery, for example, where they milk the Jersey cows, make the ice cream, and then they have a 24-hour system where you can go anytime, uh, night or day, and get it. You stick your money through the slot. Uh, there's fantastic swimming holes called the potholes, um, big jumping, about 30 feet that you can jump into the water, freezing cold. Um, kids love it. And uh, springs on the side of the road, like old carved granite watering troughs. So there's all kinds of wonderful little secrets up there. Um, now, so what happened in 1930, there was a book written about Chinook, Chinook and his family. And it was written by Eva Brunel Seeley. Now, I've got to be careful here to say that there should be whole presentations on her. Seeley, I'm sorry? Yes, Short Seeley. Short Seeley, yep. Yep. And uh, there should be whole books about her, and she should give, be given her due credit. The problem is that there's this confusion about her and the Chinooks. She never raised Chinooks. But that place, the Chinook Kennels, is actually the world center of Alaskan Malamutes and Alaskan Huskies. She's the one who got them into the AKC. She's the one, she ran sled dogs in the Olympics. The only woman to have ever done that. Why is there not a book written about her? Um, so she really deserves that. But at this time, the name Chinook Kennels and Chinook was so famous that she and her husband were able to sort of use that to get their activities going. So she got together with a teacher friend of hers. This is actually a children's book. And it has things like how to make your own book, how to sew, you know, the old, like this thing here, uh, how to make your own books, copy books and stuff. So that's a wonderful collector's item. So they lived here at what I call Seeley's Chinook Kennels. And that's where there was a museum that Arthur Walden built in the Alaskan log cabin style. And there's wonderful monuments there about other types of dogs and stuff like that. It needs some work, but if you look closely, there's the museum. It's Ed Moody, who was one of the early sled makers, went to the South Pole, but those are not Chinook dogs. They gave rides. So here's the great Chinook, the picture of the great Chinook. This in the back is an automobile chassis called the Dogmobile that you can run your dogs in the, in the summer. And it says, Chinook Kennels, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know if you can see it, but it says Dogtown, a village of huskies. So these were Alaskan huskies and Malamutes. Excuse me. So she's kind of using the Chinook name because it's so famous and kind of putting it on this other thing. At Dogtown, a village of huskies in the woods that want to lance it, you have a daily exhibition of, now, it's okay for her to say Admiral Bird sled dogs because there were 18 Chinooks, but there were 90 total dogs. So there were a bunch of dogs that were, um, and there were some born there. I have a great postcard of Amos and Andy who were born down there. And uh, so she was able to do that. <coughs> and they had a bunch of stuff from Little America. They had a storybook tour that would take you from place to place, kind of an interpretive type thing. They had the Dogmobile Rides, the Polar Museum. And, uh, but you can see these are not Chinooks. These are Huskies. There were daily lectures by Dick Moulton. There was a gift shop, of course. And uh, so there was a thing called Frolic Hour. So my understanding, people have told me this story. I haven't seen it in writing, but people have told me this story. That you could go there, pay admission to the museum, to the site, say 25 cents. Then you'd pay 10 cents or something more if you wanted to play with the dogs. So anybody who wants to play with Tug, I'm billing you right now. <laughs> so you paid to play with the dogs. And then the greatest thing in the world. If you wanted, at 4 p.m. every day, if you wanted to participate in the chow experience, you could pay to feed her dogs. I just think that is so brilliant. So, so how do we have Chinooks if the Chinook kennels didn't have Chinooks? Well, what happened was when Walden came back, this is another area that I've only heard stories and not been able to document it totally, but the theory is that Walden uh, that, that uh, the Seelys had helped out Kate Sleeper. And in exchange, 
she had signed away the trade name, Chinook Kennels. So Waldron was told, well, you're welcome to work at the Chinook Kennels, but you no longer own the name. And he said, well, what about the breeding rights? He said, well, we don't care about the breeding rights. So he hooked up with Julia Lombard, and together they could not call it the Chinook Kennels, but they founded a new kennels called the One Lancet Hubbard Kennels. Hubbard, Mother Hubbard Dog Food was one of the sponsors out of Gloucester, Mass. And so it's just a half a mile from the chapel. And so here's um, Ed Moody with Chinooks. You can see the are Chinooks. So she had to call it the Wanna Lancet Hubbard Kennels. And she was able to say exclusive breeders of purebred Chinook dogs. But she just couldn't call it Chinook Kennels. So there were puppies for sale, and this was the Boston Sportsman Show and stuff like that. So they did a lot of promotion, leading a dog's life. Uh, that's one of my favorite. It's written from the perspective of the dog. The dog's name is Shirley, and she says, well, master says G, and my brother turns right, and he gets fed. And master says ha, and he turns left, and he gets fed. So when master comes to me and says, gee, I'm going to turn right. And look, I get fed. And so it's like this wonderful, wonderful story of how he's learning and all the adventures he goes through. This is the one that has some of the greatest stories, the harness and pack. This has the story about the horses, um, 1935. So he wrote about mules, camels, elephants, oxen, horses, all kinds of beasts of burden. Um, he helped produce a film in 1939. And that's on the internet, if you want to see that. It's called Chinook's Children. It's very short. It's like seven minutes or 10 minutes, something like that. And so it's on uh, YouTube under uh, Chinook History and also some other dog sledding events that we've done. This is just one of the stills from the, from the video. Now, in 1940, Julia Lombard retired, and she sold the entire breeding stock of Chinooks, which at that time was only 20 dogs. And she sold them to this other guy who was very much a promoter, um, Perry Green, who was at that point was up in Warren, Maine. So there's actually a movement to make the Chinook the Maine state dog as well, because um, they were there since 1940 and continued until uh, the 70s. Now, this guy also was the world's exclusive breeder. And he had some really interesting stories about him and contracts. If you wanted to get a Chinook dog, you could not get one. Um, that was not fixed, spayed or neutered. And you had to go to Warren, Maine, and then later he moved to uh, Walterboro, but you had to go to those kennels, to the Perry Green Kennels. Didn't matter where you lived. You had to go there and kind of go through an interview process. 1947, he moved from Warren to, Wal Warren to Walterboro, and he built this uh, log cabin outfitter shop. And it's kind of like any time EMS or anything, you know, you're selling like, Boots it has to be log cabin-y or you know, knotty pine like this room. <laughs> you know, because you want to present that sort of rustic, you know, manly thing. I mean, this guy used to juggle um, chainsaws and he used to throw axes and he had all these kinds of shows and stuff that he did. We went there a number of years, Tug made us go. And uh, so we saw a little museum there. Now, one of the things, the great stories about the dogs is so you would come, you would sign a contract with sort of a letter of intent that you wanted to get a Chinook dog. And you'd be warmly welcomed. And Perry Green would come out. He said, well, let's go see the dogs. And you go into the kennel, and the dogs would jump all over you. And you'd pet the dogs and stuff. And you'd come back in here, sit by the fireplace. He'd tell you three or four or 20 stories before uh, getting to the point, finally. And uh, his wife, Honey, would come out with milk and cookies and set it down in front of you there on the little coffee table or whatever. The story goes, if you asked to wash your hands before you ate a cookie, after petting the dogs, that was it. Get out of the house. No dog for you. Because you weren't a dog person. So we're gonna, I'm going to watch when you bring out the refreshments. We're going to see. <laughs> Who wants to wash your hands? So you can see over the fireplace, there's actually a, a carving of a Chinook built into the fireplace. But he did that for a long time. In the meantime, Arthur Walden, um, the house bur started burning, and Walden rescued his wife, but he died of smoke inhalation the next day. So that's why the house is no longer there. They were buried together under a stone by the chapel. 
1963, Perry Green passed away. And at that time, in 1965, um, the Guinness Book of World Records for the first of three consecutive times said that the Chinooks were the rarest dog breed in the world. There are 125 dogs, but uh, somebody told me there were only 12 breeding dogs. So there was this big rescue, and a lot of people got together um, from all over the place, bred back uh, some of the characteristics, and here Tug was born. So we're back there. It is ironic, the same year, there was another children's book published about the, uh, the first Chinook. About eight months later, Tug did his first uh, sled pulling debut at the Winter Carnival in Tamworth, which still continues today. It started in 1922, I think I mentioned that. And uh, Karen Jones, who built the sled that you see there, um, was amazed when she saw this photograph because she was surprised that uh, an eighth-month-old dog could do what they call break trail. You see there's no trail in front of him. He's going through an unbroken trail. And uh, so that she was impressed with that. I'll talk more about her later. Oh, the one on the left. <laughs> my, my wife makes sure that I say that. It's the one on the left. And uh, now this is Tug's stud page. And you guys don't have to raise your hand, but you all have stud pages, right, on the internet? <laughs> right? I'm not talking about the Ashley Madison stuff. I'm talking about you photograph. Now, unlike yours, this actually shows his real hair color and you know, <laughs> his real height and his real weight. So um, these are some of his kids. And uh, this, was his, this is his most recent uh, Romantic interest, and I love her. Callista has one droop ear and one <laughs> pointed ear, so we wonder if they, what the kids will look like. This now goes to 2009 when the students there did that, and here they all are at the signing on the Capitol steps. In 2011, uh, now I got an email from a guy who is um, works over at the Veterans Center nearby. Is, is, are you here in the audience? Joel Nordholm, who taught Karen Jones, and Karen Jones taught this internship uh, about how to make the handmade dog sleds. And Joel's at the Veterans Home, um, I think over in Rochester, or you know, wherever it is, right, right, not too far from here. So this is uh, a YouTube video showing the idea is to, and I, I wish I could have brought it, I have to apologize, I had to change cars because we had a car problem. <laughs> The transmission died in the van, and I had to. My wife had to come and switch. Luckily, I'd left early enough so that I didn't miss the program. But I'll show you some pictures in a little bit. But part of it is you want to bend the wood, and it's like the old saying about the willow. I mean, the oak breaks, but the willow bends. <coughs> um, ours has fallen off the roof, going seventy something miles an hour. It just bounces. And this part here is called the brush bow. That's in the front. Now, tugs never run to a tree, but. The drivers have. <laughs> and so there's some little splits and stuff, but it's very strong. So you hit a tree, any angle, or you fall down something. It's, it's not nailed. There's no nails. There's no glue. It's all tied together and mortise and tenon so that the strength and the flexibility is there um, so it doesn't break. To make that happen, you have to bend the wood. So here they are, they've steamed the wood, and then they bend it, clamp it into place, and when it dries, it'll stay in that shape. So here's some of the pieces, uh, the long pieces, and there's a piece bent on the left. And Karen Jones, she passed away just a few uh, last year, but she was a wonderful woman, and the kind of wood is a very specific wood that has long grains, and you, you don't actually cut it or saw it, you rive it, which is you, you take a thing called a fro and you split it, and then you split that long piece off like that so that it goes with the grain. And so she would go to Rosie's, uh, one of the, where the loggers would go, six o'clock in the morning, and she'd walk in there and she says, I am looking for some good ash. Who's got some good ash for me? <laughs> and so all these loggers, of course, would take notice of that. And they would go out, and as they're clear cutting or they're working in a certain area, if they found a really particularly nice straight ash tree, as say under 12 inches in diameter, they would cut it and they'd drop it off at her dooryard. And uh, it was just one, she always had all the ash she ever wanted. <laughs> now, the other thing is if you look carefully, 
when she started steaming, she's like, no, what, how am I going to do this? She wasn't a wealthy person. She didn't want to go buy some fancy this or that. So what did she have? She had a Coleman stove, and she had a bunch of beer kegs that were lying around the house. So that's what she did. She boiled her water in beer kegs and ran the steam up through a PVC pipe. And she would get those things nice and tender, and she'd bend them into shape. And that's how she made her, her uh... oh, did I mention that the kid is my son? <laughs> yeah, so he got the apprenticeship, and uh, they became close friends. And he is now at Northeastern University, whose mascot, of course, is the Huskies. So he's a Husky. <laughs> in uh, mechanical engineering. Now, so here is the sled. And this is what I wanted to bring. But you can see that the brush bow is the part they were working on. And you can see how that bends. And it's built right into the rest of it. The driving bow, that's the handle. And you stand uh, the runners. And there's a, play, a thing called a false runner, which is an extra piece of wood that wears out. And then you replace it. Uh, basket bed, the slats, and the brake, which is a little piece of metal that comes down, or one of those that's a snow brake. And you actually stand on the footboard. And so there's no wheel. There's no transmission gear. It's all by voice command. And then there's a little bit of stuff that you can do. If you look at the video, you'll notice that as the guys are turning a certain way, they're standing on the, uh, the runners and uh, holding the driving bow. But then they'll lean one side or the other. And that just a little bit of that can make it happen. That can twist it or warp it. And sometimes they'll drag their feet and slow down just a little bit. And other times, if you watch, if they're going uphill, they'll kind of push and run a little bit. So it's really fascinating to watch that. And what's so great, these things, they're very, it's a tool, but it's a very, very simple tool. It's kind of like a hammer. And I've watched, we've done a lot of programs with kids. And we just give the kids a hammer, or a screwdriver, or a hand drill. And we don't tell them anything about it. We don't tell them how it works. We let them figure it out. The tool teaches you. So we didn't have to read a whole bunch of books. We just learned through trial and error. And yes, we did fall over. And yes, we did <laughs> have some incidences here and there. But the, the tool teaches you how, how to make it work. This one was handcrafted by Ed Moody, who was the guy who taught Joel Norderholm. Joel Norderholm taught Karen Jones. Um, Karen Jones taught my son, and he's continuing the practice. Um, Karen Jones, another thing about her is her uh, kennels and her dog sleds were um, marked Narak kennels. And when we were talking to her, I asked her, you know, Chinook, that's great. What a neat word. I said, is Narak uh, Inuit? Is it, you know? What, what, where does Narak come from? <laughs> she looked at me. <laughs> she said, it's my name spelled backwards. <laughs> Karen, so Narak. But she, lo you know, she loved the sound of it. She, uh, she got so many people on that one. Uh, so the dogs are born to run. These are my kids running. Uh, we do run um, Tug with his buddy Fenway there, who's kind of a black lab mix. You can kind of see him in the bottom picture. This was at Christmas a few years ago when it snowed on Christmas Day. And uh, my daughter, this is on YouTube, and she just comes out of the driveway, just whips around and down the road. Probably the fastest run they ever did. When we got Tug, go back to that picture when he was about eight months old, and we were getting ready for the winter carnival. And we didn't want to be complete idiots and look like fools. And so we would ask Rick Scoglin, who was the guy that helped arrange this for us. And um, he kind of kept putting us off. He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just measure Tug at eight months. What's his height at the withers? And what's his length? And so on. I'll have a harness made up. And this is his most recent harness. The harness is pretty simple. It's got a part for the neck. And uh, let's see if I can figure this out. has a little X, this is called an X harness, there we go. It goes around the back. And uh, tug. <laughs> tug. Give me, yeah, good boy. Ah, ah, ah. So it just goes like that. And then, pa, good boy. 
paw. Good boy. And then we just hook this up. There we go. So uh, he's ready to go now. <laughs> So we hooked him up, and we, we actually hooked him up to a spare tire. And he said, so, so how do we get him? What do, how do we, do we get treats? Do, you know, I've got some white stuff for him. I don't want to say the word. Later on, he gets some of these. Just, uh, you know, so you do that kind of rewarding. He says, you don't have to worry about that. This, this is bred into them. So he says, here's what you do. Let go. And he just took off like a rocket. And he says, now call him back. We yelled, he turned around, came right back. And you know that, that was about it. And he was ready to go. And uh, so we taught him a little bit of things later. But it, I'll show you what it has to do. It's all about that breeding. There are certain dogs that will go in holes and look for ferrets and sheep dogs. The border collies, their instinct, they see the sheep as prey, as food. And so when the Border collie goes this way, the sheep go off the other way, and vice versa. And so then the, the master teaches the dog, when I whistle this pitch, you do this. When I whistle that pitch, you do that. Or I say this word on by, or come, come by, or whatever. So it's that kind of thing. But the instinct is there. You can't get a poodle to herd sheep. <laughs> a Chinook would not herd sheep. I don't know. Uh, most dogs love to run. In Laconia, the Lymans had a team of Irish setters that used to run the race every year. I uh, couldn't imagine. I never saw them. I've seen pictures in black and white, but could you imagine a team of 12 Irish setters running across uh, the lake? So, uh, so it has to do with the breeding. And we'll talk about that in just a moment and the difference between him and his buddy Fenway. All right, so that's the... Uh, the lead dog, and again, not necessarily the strongest, um, but the smartest, the one you want to know where the thin ice is and um, the one you want not to chase after squirrels because that's a disaster, I can tell you that. <laughs> then you have your wheel dogs, and they're sort of the exact opposite. His buddy Fenway is a wheel dog. Strong, absolutely obedient, loyal, not the sharpest tool in the shed. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Then you have your point dogs, your swing dogs. And if you've ever seen the Disney movie Snow Dogs, the guy tries to bring them out and put the dog where he thinks they belong. No. We had a, we had a thing down towards a Wagon Wheel Farm. I think we had some like 35 dogs we hooked up to a um, dog mobile, to a dry uh, a summer wheeled vehicle. And the best thing everybody did was just unhook their dogs and let them line themselves up. There was a little bit of snarling, there was a little bit of looking at each other, but all of a sudden, stretched themselves right out. And uh, so they, they, they know, they communicate in ways that we can't begin to understand. So the line that goes up in the middle is called the gang line, holds the gang together, and they're tied at the front with the neck line. And then the line that they pull with is the tug line, and that's where he gets his name. Now, when we, um, a few years ago, we uh, were accepted into the American Kennel Club. So we're now at Westminster. And uh, New Hampshire dog won, actually won, the first couple of years. And um, the Conway Daily Sun wanted to do a feature, so we got some, we got this set up for them. But what's interesting, you can see the intensity with which they run. You know, their eyes constantly focused. And the other thing that's interesting about this is this is actual multiple exposure. This is just tug. So this is tug with, you know, picture taken every fraction of a second. And this is what he's all about right here. You know, you can just see he bears into it when he's wearing that thing and you hook him up. Any kind of weight, he'll, he'll about break your arm if you're holding on to him. All right, so breed standards. So we'll go back to the stud page. The, uh, what do you call it? Breed standard is that they're supposed to be between 23 and 27 inches high for mature males 
average of 70 pounds, and it was so amazing, because at that time, Tug was exactly 27 inches and 70 pounds. He's gained a little bit since then. Um, they're supposed to look muscular. They're supposed to look thin now. So they don't look like the great Chinook, the old Chinooks. And they're actually different clubs. This is, he's like a DNA genotype. So we keep the ancestry going, do some outbreeding, otherwise they go crazy, purebred dogs. Um, but then there's other groups that try and breed them to look like the great Chinook, but then they pitch in a lot of stuff. So when we did the DNA analysis, remember I was telling you about the sheepdogs, the border collies, right? Well, there's another type of sheepdog prevalent in the Pyrenees, the Alps, all the way through Turkey. And there's a type of breed over there called the Anatolian sheepdog. Huge, massive dogs. The way that they herd the sheep is that they are brought up with baby sheep and baby sheepdogs. And they're buddies, they eat together, they feed together, and all of a sudden, little brother gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's this Anatolian sheepdog that's like three times the size of the sheep. And the shepherd puts a spiked collar, iron spikes, three or five inches long. And so when the wolves start coming out of the hills, big brother fights them off. And so what happens, instead of the sheep being terrified, like they're being chased down for a dinner, when big brother goes that way, they all go that way because they want to be protected. And, and so it's a whole different way. And that's what makes this guy such a perfect kind of friendly dog. He thinks all of you are his brothers and sisters and his friends. And uh, so that's, that's what's important. Whereas if you, have, if you go to the races now, they actually tell you not to go near the dogs because these are athletes. And they're, they can be vicious with each other, and they can be vicious with people. Um, you know, they're, they're athletes. You don't want to bother somebody, a tennis star, when they're at the US Open. But this guy, you know, he'll stop. And I, I, asked, I asked Rick, I said, would, would a Chinook be a good uh, watchdog, a good security dog? So, I'll tell you the story. So here's how the Chinooks catch a robber. First of all, they welcome them in. Come on in. Come on in. Oh, they hide silver over here. There's some money under the, in that drawer. Sit down. Have a sandwich. Have a few beers. And so basically, you come home and you find the robber passed out with the dog sitting on his lap. And uh, that's, how you, that's how the Chinooks catch robbers. Sure. And now in Alaska, they, uh, they uh, have the pups handled by tourists to make them friendly and used to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, so do you do that too? We do. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Yeah, he's, he's great around kids, you know, great around all kinds of people. He just loves attention. Yeah, starting with the pups. Yep. Yeah, we have the clubs. We have uh, one of the events that we went to. <laughs> was the, the Chinook Olympics. And, and our club is very open, so we actually have Chinook alikes, and we have, you can be a Chinook for the day. So if you bring your Josh down or your poodle, they put their paw up and say the Chinook you know, uh, oath, and they can be a Chinook for the day and go swimming in the kiddie pools and stuff. But we had a costume contest, and my daughter had a pink Johnny Damon t-shirt, but he had just gone to the, to the Yankees. So what she did is she put the t-shirt on Tug, and she put a pair of devil ears on him. <laughs> and so his costume was Johnny Damon Yankee Devil Dog, or something like that. And he won, he won the contest for the best costume that day. Let's see, so color, uh, there's supposed to be this tawny, honey gold. The black markings that you saw in the earlier pictures of the Chinook, it's so, they're so distinctive, even when he was a little kid. But they, they kind of make me think of Egyptian hieroglyphics. And when he was, when he was little, we used to always joke to my daughter, I said, did, did you put eyeliner on Tug again today? Because he has it. So black muzzle, black on the tips of the ears. They also have a double coat. And feel free to just dig in there. And he has these long outer hairs that shed water. So he's like he's wearing a raincoat or a parka all the time. But inside, he's like a beaver, and he has these short little downy things. So he's always wearing um, 
you know, like a jacket, like a down jacket. So he's very well adapted for that. And it doesn't seem to bother him in the summer, but he's, you know, he's perfectly fine in, in the winter. He has this, which we only see as a decorative thing. I don't know any function for it, but he has a shawl or apron. And we think he looks sort of like an Elizabethan or Shakespearean actor, you know. <laughs> Makes him look very regal. His tail is what they call a saber tail, and it curves up um, when he's happy. And the, it's, you know, little things like this is what the judges look at, that the hair at the base of the tail is supposed to be longer than the hair at the top tip of the tail, and it's supposed to gently shape. So that's why he's won a bunch of different you know, confirmation things. Here's another practical thing. His feet are actually well arched, and he has these thick pads, uh, cushion pads, and so his um, claws, he can like dig in if it's a little icy or slippery, so he's always wearing like crampons. But then the coolest thing is his feet are webbed. So he's always wearing snowshoes. So he can go out on the ice and claw his way around. But if there's, say, two or three feet of snow and the thinnest of crust, he can get up on that and dance around like a ballerina. It's just amazing. And of course, his legs are so tall that if it's only two feet or so, or even three feet, he can just, you know, he only has these little legs that go through the snow, so he can just go in like an icebreaker. The other thing is his chest is narrow, and if you feel, feel his chest bone, it's like the keel of a boat, just like an icebreaker. And then he has these tiny little hips. So he just goes through and breaks the path through the snow, and the little hips just follow him. Now Fenway, is kind of a black lab mix. He's big in the front, and he's even bigger in the back. <laughs> so if we call him and they try and go through the snow, Tug just snakes his way through, and Fenway goes a few feet and gets stuck. And, little, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and if, if, if Fenway was to jump up on top of the crust, he would just go right through. <laughs> he's a big, you know, big heavy dog. So remember, unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> Shall we meet Tug? And I'll take questions too. Oh. Yes. You said the Chinook was lost in 1929? Uh, uh, 27, yeah. Who then is stuffed? Oh, no, you're right, 29. 12. Who, who then is stuffed in the New Hampshire uh, Historical Society Museum in Concord? Stuffed? I don't know that. Somebody on display there. Oops. Huh. No, I don't know. A, a stuffed dog? Yeah. Well, is, is, it a, is it an actual dog or is it a, like a toy, stuffed toy dog? Because one of the things I didn't show is that the Steve company that did the teddy bears created a line of Chinooks um, in, in, in exhibition. And so... <laughs> Huh. There, there are some stuffed dogs. Um, Togo and um, I'm trying to think the other guy, it was a Sepala dog. Uh, the ones who actually did the serum run, the, those dogs are stuffed. Um, you know, um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. I'll have to look into that. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. What a great drawing. Oh, my son did that. That's beautiful. This is a dog that followed them home literally from a walk one day. Oh my goodness. In the neighborhood here. And she was just a little pup. But she had huge, huge feet. They do have and we big could, feet. We couldn't find the owner. Can you show that to everybody? You do. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so she was beautiful. We let her go that night and Tuck. we said to each other that if Tuck. she if she loved us, <laughs> she would be there in the morning. Yeah, she was. and she was. Oh, that's um, awesome. So that's her, and her. Love a girl. Yeah, give her everybody. Feet were webs. And when you said that, because I never. Tuck. <laughs> <laughs> Love. Tuck, sit. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, she was, she was uh, heavier, but about his size. 
Yeah. And she uh, she pulled the kids in their plastic toboggan up and down the up and down Grand. Oh, Street. neat, neat. Uh, we there was a vet in Merrimack at the time. His name was Eric Klopp. Hmm. and he was. I said, do you know what kind of what breeds are in her? And he got a funny look on his face, and he said, big brown dog. <laughs> big brown dog. And, but he had worked as a young man in kennels up and knew the Chinook. Oh, neat. And he's the one that showed us where we could get a harness. Oh, and cool. Anyway. Yeah, there um, are some cloughs up there. Yeah. There are some cloughs up there? Yep. Well, yeah. he might have retired up there. He loves to be scratched under his neck. And another a nickname we have for him is Eileen. You'll notice he just he leans on me. He'll he'll <laughs> lean on you. Speaking of the Cluffs, reminds me of another story. There was a, a woman Ida Clough who was related to the Bickfords. And I'll tell you two two really quick stories. So I got an email with a photograph of a sled, and it said C. Bickford, and the guy was asking it said Tamworth. And did you know about him? So yeah, I told him the story. Chet Bigfrey made these. Um, he was one of the guys, many guys who made the sleds. And uh, I said they went down to the South Pole. And the guy emailed me back. He says, Yeah, I know. I'm at the South Pole. And <laughs> I didn't notice the. You know, it was like U.S. something, Geo something. And so they had a whole bunch of these Bigford sleds in perfect condition down there. But the thing, Helen Bigford used to tell this great story. When, uh, during World War II, there was the 10th Mountain Division, and there was experiments with the idea of having dog sleds or sled dogs fight and carry machine guns, and so, you know, because they could get up the mountain passes and stuff like that. Tuggy, Tuggy, come here. Tuggy. Do you mind if I It's fine with me. Just. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so the story goes, so, so the Sealies did training of uh, dogs, sled dogs during World War II. But then they got word, um, and they actually found this guy and prosecuted him. There was a guy who was a Nazi spy, and he was monitoring the radio, and he was reporting on the training. So they said, well... Tamworth want to land it too close to the Atlantic Ocean, too close to the U-boats. So in the meantime, Chet and Helen had been dating. They decided to get married. So they got married. And then that night, at, you know, during the wedding reception, they got uh, sealed orders that he, they were to uh, go on a train in the middle of the night to Rimini, Montana. It was a, it was a secret. They had to all go. So she said she had the most interesting honeymoon in a boxcar with over 100 sled dogs going out from Tamworth to Montana. Tug, Tuggy. Hey, he's just getting inside. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come on, buddy. Where is his? Yeah, sit. Good boy. I know. I know. Um, there's a group called um, Chinook Owners Association on the internet, and uh, so you, uh, then they also Chinook New England. So, in fact, there was a great uh, litter just born, um, but, but they, have, they have all these, you know, stud pages, and then, of course, the uh, puppy pages. So, yeah, there's some. Um, well, you just, you contact the different breeders, um, trying to think. I think this one, last one I saw was out of um, Maine. Um, but yeah, just look on the internet. You can find, you know, who's available. Love. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are, yeah, there, I don't know if they're still active, but Granite Hill out of uh, Dover, I think it is, Dover or Durham. Um, you know, it's interesting because I'll, the cost and everything, the factors really depend. So when Bear, uh, Little Bear, um, one of his buddies, won uh, Westminster, his stu stud fees went way up. <laughs> you know, yes. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Sure. You mentioned it has two coats. Yes. Did you find that they shed like 
twice a year like huskies do? Or? Not too bad. No, they kind of shed a little bit all year, but not too bad. Being that it's a working dog, if you don't work them, do you find that they're rambunctious or a little more hard to... That's a good question. And you know, when I made the joke about the um, bipolar, that's one of the great things about the Chinooks is unlike some of our friends who have racing dogs uh, or even working dogs, he eats anything. And so we don't have to feed him the super high protein, you know, the expensive stuff. And he is happy to sit and watch TV with us, um, hang out, go swimming, whatever. But then when we start saying words about this and start hooking him up, he just turns into like a running racing monster. Um, but then, at the end, he turns back into a pet, puppy dog. And I want to ask you one other thing. Um, what this, do these dogs bark differently, or do they howl, like sometimes husks? Uh, he howls once in a while, but not. They tend to bark like dogs. Yeah, and not much. They don't bark much. And uh, oh, I should tell you back to the idea of the bipolar. Um, after a while, you know, the dogs get a certain habit. And Tug has a certain side of the couch, and Fenway has another side of the couch. And one time, Tuggy, Fenway made a mistake and sat on Tug's side of the couch. And so Tug just looked at him. It was so funny. It was like in slow motion. He goes over in the other room. He gets Fenway's favorite toy, just casually brings it in. And then he goes, <laughs> and of course, Fenway gets right off, starts running out, picks up the toy. And Tug just slinks into a seat and sits down. And Fenway is like, what happened? And he's actually done that several times. You know, he, he uh, outsmarts him. I think it's OK. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. We actually have him. Oh, cool. What's his name or her name? Her name is Roxy, and she comes from Mountain Laurel. Oh, really? Yeah, great. Yeah, they come up in uh, usually for the Winter Carnival in February. Yeah, so you guys should all come up for that. So what's their lifespan? Well, she's 12. It's about yeah. between 10 and 15 years. Yeah. yeah. He's like a 70-year-old man. Yeah. So very good with Oh, very good with kids, yeah. And poodles. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Yes. I have to presume that he must have known Ed Clark. Yes. Uh, yeah, he, he, I was a good friend of his, and we did a lot of work with hydroelectric property. Yep. But uh, he was telling me how uh, they were making harnesses in the kitchen for the uh, raid that they did up here in London. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you, you may know Clark's Trading Post originally was a dog sled uh, place. I think they called it Eskimo Dog Ranch or something like that. And um, his wife was the first woman to go up to Mount Washington and uh, by dog sled. And she got, I guess she got frostbite in her lungs from that. Yes. And uh, was it Monahan, Robert Monahan, and some of the other weather guys had to help her down? But, you know, that, that was an amazing thing to, uh, for her to do. And yeah, they ran dogs their whole life. Yeah, fantastic. In fact, there's a lot of that history at Clark's Trading Post, as well as up by the Glen House in the, in the barn up there and stuff, and on the auto road. Does Tuck swim? He does. He, he kind of snorkels. He, he, uh, <laughs> he, he, He'll go out and he'll 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 stick his head under the water and then come right back up. So he doesn't like his head completely underwater. <laughs> what, what can you do? Uh, I don't know. I think I'm not sure if he thinks she's romantic or he wants a snack. <laughs> no, he he wouldn't eat, he wouldn't do that. Yeah, romance. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, they're fine with cats. They don't. Yeah, he doesn't bother anybody or anything. He just wants hugs and kisses and scratches. <laughs>
Yeah. I, I grew up with a German Shepherd that was sired by Rin Tin Tin. Oh my goodness, oh, yeah. wow. Very cool. Yeah, it was an amazing dog. Did you get residuals? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, see what he does? He leans right yes, on you. Yes, he does. Yeah. 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 My mother said that the, uh, she trusted the dog more than she trusted us. <laughs> I had three brothers. I think, I think uh, Walden was like that, too. He really, come on, Tuggy. He's got the long hair of Belgian Shepherd, I think. Yeah, he's, he has the two coats. He has the, the long hair, and then he has these thin little, I mean, these fat little, uh, what do you call it, like down almost. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, he's got these little tiny, and like I say, if you feel his chest here, it's just he like sharp little, t yes, he does, he sits and stands on you, he's constantly standing on my foot, <laughs> I, I, you know, what's he thinking, <laughs> <laughs> and he's, they're so good with time, I mean, 10 o'clock, he comes right up to you, if you're sitting on the couch, and says, it's time for you to go. <laughs> Bedtime. Time for you to go. And then early in the morning, same time. I don't know how they do it. They start whimpering. Just the two. Tug and Fenway, yeah. All righty. Thank you.